Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, sorry for the short delay, but that was even fast because I uh, honestly almost missed my talk during to the shift. That was also why I was back there. <laughs> Good, first time that that happened. Um, but nevertheless, I will be ready. ready. So the first thing uh, to mention is uh, I changed the title to be a bit more concrete because I, I decided to... Um, is this position good, or do you still have this feedback in the microphone? Because I hear that. Okay, so um, I, um, I decided to, uh, to tell you about something more concrete, and uh, that is uh, our recent experiments on uh, spin charge separation and hidden correlations uh, in Fermi Hubbard chains. And before I start, um, just uh, I want to make sure uh, to set the stage because of the two talks in this session before were basically on solid state uh, qubit systems and uh, I move now on uh, to a different platform which is uh, neutral atoms uh, in optical lattices. Uh, where, the, where the focus is uh, clearly not so much on the quantum computation but more on the quantum simulation uh, uh, side which you saw actually by the fact that we were basically missing in that uh, famous science table there. Okay, so um, what we are interested in uh, is uh, we, we are interested in exploring uh, with this experiment the uh, uh, Fermi Hubbard model. And uh, why is it at all interesting uh, to do quantum simulations on the Fermi Hubbard model? Well, the Fermi Hubbard model is the most prominent uh, traded toy model. Uh, for high temperature superconductors, um, where you probably know that uh, many things in the details that are really unclear. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, what is really unclear in the superconductors is really the, the uh, exact nature and even the which phases are there. Um, in this uh, phase diagram, somewhere in the vicinity, this DSC, is D wave superconducting, somewhere in the vicinity of this uh, superconducting uh, dome. So um, this here is really the phase diagram that is conjectured for the, for the uh, superconductors, and the, the question is now really that we want to address with our quantum simulators. Can we find these interesting phases in, in this actually most simplest, uh, or well, let's say, uh, most prominent toy model, which is uh, uh, this Fermi Hubbard model here. I, I'm going to explain in the next slide the different terms there uh, to give you a little bit of intuition in that. So um, how can we actually implement the Fermi Hubbard model in AMO systems? Well, the basic workhorse that we have in the lab are optical lattices uh, that we create by interfering laser beams. So what you see here is uh, a little bit an artist's image of a three-dimensional optical lattice that is uh, generated by interference of this beam, which somehow, well, it's hard to, by this beam and this beam, so that basically leaves you with a periodic array of intensity maxima that, it, that are these uh, gray dots. And then we load uh, atoms uh, into the systems, uh, into the system, and uh, these atoms, in our case fermions, well, they can hop from side to side um, they might have a spin, that is when they become uh, interesting for fermions because otherwise they, they do nothing too much interesting because of it's basically Pauli blocked. Um, and they can have on-site interactions and that's what's depicted here in this 2D example. So again, this here is basically a hopping term. These uh, fermions of both spins, red and blue, they can hop around in the lattice. When they sit on a sim single side, they interact. This is this interaction U term. And again, Pauli blocking two red and two blau blue guys can never sit. Uh, on top of each other. So this is, this is the framework. And again, this sounds like a very simple uh, model. I mean, I can, I can draw a very simple toy cartoon here. But again, to, to stress the, the, the low temperature phase diagram of this model, in the regime where there are also vacancies, like where you have like a filling below one, uh, is really uh, not clear. And that is what we target. Um, in this talk, um, I actually not talk about the two-dimensional model. It's basically, um, the thing is, in this business of quantum simulation, it's always you first have to understand your quantum simulator, you have to verify that you believe the results and so on, so it's always a good idea to first test your simulator in, uh, in, in, in a regime where you basically know what you expect. So uh, they, and, uh, what we're doing here is, we are studying basically the Fermi Hubbard uh, model in one dimension, where we know this is basically a Luttinger liquid, um, we know basically everything you can say, um, but um, what is very interesting is actually that the physics in 1D um, is very universal. That uh, goes under this uh, keyword of Luttinger liquids. And um, 
uh, our experiments uh, can, can provide, uh, well, a fresh new help to understand and so on, the fundamental uh, uh, effects that appear there. So it's a, in the sense of a textbook-like setting. And what I want to talk about is one of the uh, most prominent uh, effects that, uh, that appear there, and that is uh, spin charge separation in one dimension, basically the independence of spins uh, and charge, of spin and charge degrees of freedom. Um, the second thing uh, is, so why are we interested to explore 1D? Well, basically, I explained it already. You have to calibrate your, uh, your, your quantum simulator and be ready uh, to explore then uncharted territory in two dimensions uh, or develop new techniques that you can transfer to other dimensions or also develop uh, new techniques to test, uh, well, to get access to new observables. And for that, I will provide an example which is actually directly measuring uh, a topological order, order parameter um, that can identify, for example, topo topological order in Haldane uh, chains. Okay, so um, first to set the stage, uh, again, I want to uh, link to solid state observations of, uh, of spin charge uh, separation. So these are three uh, prominent uh, experiments. I, oh, here, this is actually wrong. This is 2005, I think. This is, uh, was uh, basically the first one. Uh, where they basically, in solid state, uh, you have very different observables than we have uh, with the atomic systems, and typical measurements are some incarnation of spectroscopy. Something is wrong with this. Connector. No. Okay. Maybe I should speak not too loud to let the sound waves not shake the connector or whatever. Okay, so, um, well, we have three spectroscopies, uh, basically two tunnel current, uh, tunnel spectroscopy measurements uh, and one uh, angle result photo emission measurement. Well, the thing is I want to highlight is, so the typical, uh, typical results here is you, you change some energy and um, you see some spectrum and then you see spin charge separation in these, uh, in these experiments very indirectly, I would say, but what you see is basically you see a splitting uh, of, the, of the excitation spectrum, and you can uh, extract two modes, and uh, then um, uh, one uh, is said to be the spin-on mode, and one is said to be the hole-on mode. So that is basically uh, what has been seen uh, in solid state in this context. In ultra-cold atoms, again, we have very different observables, um, and that before I come what we actually did, I want to uh, show you two, two uh, very prominent uh, proposals in this context. One is from 2003, and the idea is basically now with the ultra-cold atoms, we, we can directly track the dynamics of the system. We can take images and we can basically ask questions like, given we made an excitation at point A, where is this excitation at a later point in time and space? So this is basically related to both ex uh, these uh, uh, proposals here. So the idea is you make an excitation initially uh, at some point in space zero, and then you look basically two wave fronts traveling outwards, one in the spin, one in the charge degree of freedom. Again, spin charge separation, uh, you saw the spectrum basically means um, you get a spin and the charge velocity, both were linear spectra before, um, and that means you see diff two different velocities directly, and that means after some time you really see directly, well, spin and charge, they spatially separated, uh, and you can even fit then the velocity and extract uh, the story directly. So this was, um, how, well, many proposals uh, also around this and many ex experimental attempts uh, were driven by these proposals basically to have some way of seeing this directly. Um, but again, I will switch again. In this talk, I will not talk about uh, these dynamical aspects of spin charge separation, but I want to uh, uh, show you how we can actually measure, well, basically spin charge separation directly based on the measurement of correlation functions between spin and charge uh, degrees of freedom that we have access to with our quantum gas microscopes. So what you see here is a single shot image that we took in our experiments um, of, uh, of uh, lithium atoms. So each red dot here is a lithium atom in a two-dimensional optical lattice. And the point is, this is really the density distribution of one quantum realization of, the, of, of this system. That means we can calculate now very co complicated correlation function based on these shots. So I can ask, the, for example, the question, what is the correlation of having a hole here, an atom here, a hole here, a hole here, a hole here, a hole here, wherever you wish. So we can make non-local, uh, non uh, we can analyze non-local correlation functions, and that is basically where, where our new analysis basically is based on. 
Okay, um, but I don't want to be completely abstract. I was also, as an experimentalist, want to give you a flavor here how this actually looks. Um, it's actually a pretty complicated machine uh, that we have uh, set up there in the experiment. So it's actually consisting of three optical tables. I show only two here. So you see this one is basically our preparation table to prepare all the laser beams. Um, so uh, like hands-on work means you have to have this all under control, keep it stable and so on. And then we guide the light by fibers to the, to the main table. And the actual ultra-cold atoms, they live uh, on this table. And I should say this is actually a photograph from the side. So this is not a top view. So we become uh, three-dimensional in terms of optics. Uh, around the microscope. So where are the atoms? I could make the guessing game, and maybe you see that there's something, there's more space here in the center, and that's actually where the atoms are. Let's zoom in. So what you see here is basically a glass cell. It's roughly four by four centimeters, and the atoms, they live in the center there in an ultra-high uh, ultra vacuum environment. Um, and, and that makes them actually such a nice uh, isolated quantum system. And then we absorb them with a microscope. What is the microscope? Well, that looks, doesn't look very spectac spectacular. It's this piece of plastic from below um, that, we, that we use to detect the atoms um, with actually a resolution of uh, roughly one micrometer. So we are not so much uh, in the typical microscope domain, but uh, I want to give you an idea why, why that actually works. And uh, the idea is we have actually the possibility to generate pretty complicated uh, lattice structures. What we, what we use in this experiment here is basically a two-dimensional super lattice. How does a two-dimensional super lattice? Well, it can look very diff differently depending on how you choose its parameters. But what is shown here is basically the light intensity distribution for one specific parameter uh, setting of the system. The important thing to remember is we have two, two length scales here. We have a large well separation of 2.4 micron. And we have a small well separation of 1.2 micron. Remember, I told you the microscope, we have a resolution of one micron. So even the smallest one, we have no problems to observe that. Now you might ask the question, OK, but typical um, uh, um, ultra-cold atom lattice experiments, they typically work with 500 nanometers. That is actually something that is usually even required to have long enough tumbling time scales for the, let's say, usual atoms. With usual atoms, I mean rubidium. Um, what we use is lithium. Lithium is much lighter. It's something like 12, roughly 12 times lighter, I think. And that means it can tunnel over much larger distances. And that is the trick, actually, that let, uh, let us get away with these large uh, lattice distances. And that is at the root, at, really at the, at the heart of uh, the experiments uh, I'm going to present you uh, in a minute. So um, another thing, um, just to give you an idea how these quantum gas microscopes work, so how did I how did I actually, or how did we take this, uh, uh, this image with the red dots that were all these uh, lithium atoms? Well, what you have to do is you have to keep your atoms at one point in space and then somehow make them scatter photons. How many at photons they scatter? They typically scatter 10,000 photons per atom. 10,000 photons per atom means basically you heat them so strongly that they will hop out of these lattice sites very easily and with pro basically pro uni uh, uh, unity probability, meaning we cannot take these images because they start to move. So what do we do is we overlay an extra lattice. These are these, these black dots. So the red dots, uh, let's say, is the super lattice that I showed you in a minute before. The, red, the black dots are now uh, 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 is an extra lattice that we call the pinning lattice. And this we can make very, very deep. So what we do is we, we shine in just for detection this spinning lattice, keep the atoms at their position, and then use uh, so-called Raman sideband cooling. So this is what is called R1, R2, and the repumper. So these are just the lasers you need for Raman sideband cooling. And what, what this does is this allows you to scatter photons while keeping the atoms in the individual wells. So they try to escape, you try to heat up, but then this cooling mechanism brings them down to the ground, to the, close to the ground state again, so they cannot escape. And with that, we can scatter uh, enough photons and obtain these images. So why this long story about all this technology? Um, because of here's really uh, what uh, enables the experiments on spin charge separations. And that is a specific detection technique with which we can locally, locally means on each and every lattice site, can detect the spin state of the atom simultaneously with the charge degrees of freedom. Basically, it means we can detect locally, is the atom spin up, is the atom spin down, is the atom not there at all, or do we have a spin up and a spin down atom on one, and, on, 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 on one side? So how does that work? First of all, I said we do experiments in 1D. So 
This is, uh, is actually an image of uh, such 1D chains. So this is one 1D chain, another one, another one, another one. So this is five. And they are completely separated concerning the dynamics in, in the vertical direction. So that's what's illustrated by these uh, thick lines. Um, and point is now, you see that the separation of the lattice sites in the horizontal direction is half uh, as in the vertical direction. So we use at this one here only one of our our super lattice is basically in this direction, while here we have the long component on. But now, prior to imaging, we can use this extra super lattice in the vertical direction as something like a local mini Stan Gerlach to uh, get resolution for the spins. So what we do is, we have first this large lattice spacing, and then we switch on, prior to imaging, we switch on a magnetic field gradient, and that means for the spin ups, the situation looks like that if we ramp up this uh, short scale lattice component, and for the spin downs, the situation looks like that. That means the spin down uh, goes to the, from your side right well, the spin up goes to the left well. Or on the image here, is left and right is up and down. So let's see. This one here, basically, was a spin down atom. It moved down. This one here was a spin up atom. It's moved up. This one here was a doublon. So we had a, a spin up and a spin down with atom. And uh, well, these are the, well, you might say boring sites, but they're actually not because if we want to see the interplay between the holes and spins, this is an empty site. Uh, and we get full resolution, uh, as I said, uh, sidewise in this way. And then we can also calculate, uh, answer question like, what is the probability for, or what is, uh, how are the spins uh, uh, predominantly if I have, do I have a hole yes here? For example, here uh, I, have a, I have a basically a missing atom, so now I can ask questions. What, what is the spin alignment around, uh, around such holes, or um, uh, what, are, what do holes in generally do to the spin order uh, in a longer chain? And that is actually, actually the type of question uh, we're going to ask. So before um, coming, to the, uh, coming to the doped uh, Hubbard physics and doped means in a situation where holes are important in the system, I want to show, show you first results in the, in the simple case, basically in the case where the system is at half filling, uh, and just to, uh, what, what half filling means basically we have an equal amount of spin ups and spin downs in the system and no holes. So there's an atom at each side, and that means the charge degree of freedom is not there at all because of the charge, there is nothing where the charge can move. The only motion that you can have is basically spin motion. Um, and in this uh, uh, situation, the Hubbard model uh, actually maps to a Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And of course, with, given the technology I just described you, we can just check, do we see antiferromagnetic correlation in the system when we load and prepare these chains? And uh, the answer you see here, so if we measure a standard two-point correlator at a distance of one side, two side, three side, four sides, we see basically we have anti-aligned spins, aligned spins, anti-aligned spins, aligned spins over these four sides. So we really see these systems, if we cool them as cold as we can at the moment, they, uh, they, they, they show antiferromagnetic correlation, and uh, at the moment what we, what we get is something like a correlation length of 1.3 side corresponding to an entropy of 0.5 kB. And that's again an example why it's interesting to benchmark your system in 1D because of these numbers. How do we get these numbers? Well, this number we can measure, but how do we get this number? Uh, we cannot really measure. What we have to do is we have to ask our theory colleagues, in this case, uh, Jacobo Nespolo and Lode Polet, and they do QMC uh, with all the, all the experimental uh, stuff in there, and uh, we can then compare and, and get this number. So that's like this benchmarking idea. Um, we are by far not the only ones working on this problem. Um, actually, that's a very prominent uh, 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 problem that is attacked in the ultra-cold community and uh, very prominently uh, in two dimensions in the other experiment. And uh, I want to highlight this uh, 2007 nature of uh, Markus Greiner's group, where they actually implemented a new way of cooling um, and they can reach actually antiferromagnetic order. I, in this case, I would not even call it correlations anymore. I think it's justified to call it there even antiferromagnetic order because of they see basically that their full sample of roughly 100 sites actually orders. Um, so um, that is very prominent, uh, 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 very, very promising results uh, for these ultra-cold uh, 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 atom systems because it shows basically that we really can access the, uh, the low energy physics uh, of these uh, complex models. And just to mention, uh, a similar experiments are going on in Martin Zwerlein's group at MIT, uh, Michael Kohl's uh, group in Bonn, and Vasim Bakr's group in uh, Princeton. All right, so now um, let's uh, add holes to the system. So how do we, uh, what, what do we expect if we add holes? So 
let's, let's keep it simple and understand this intuitively first. So we have here a kinetic energy part uh, in the Fermi Hubbard model. So this comes as usual with a negative sign. That means basically the holes, they want to maximize this, this, this hopping term. They want to be delocalized as much as possible. That's what this cartoon well <laughs> says, that if you go from full filling, which is black, to a, a hole, you don't know where the hole is. It's completely delocalized. So that's what the holes want to do. The spins, the spins they still want to antiferromagnetically uh, uh, order in this case. And that means they want to show something like in this cartoonish way, this up, down, up, down, up, down structure. The thing in 1D is now we can make both uh, uh, um, decrease of freedom simultaneously happy. And that is, that is really uh, uh, what, uh, what shows you that, uh, uh, well, Basically, this works because if you have spin charge separation, it basically means uh, the spins, they, they uh, don't care for the holes. The holes can freely delocalize even if you have antiferromagnetic order. And uh, that is, uh, again, in a, in a uh, cartoonish way shown here. So let's assume we have a situation where we have a spin up, where we have a spin up, a hole, and another spin up. Now, if you would move the hole, the hole moves here, then it would cost one j, uh, one j of energy. J is the, uh, is the uh, spin exchange energy um, here because if you have two spin ups next to each other instead of a spin up and a spin down. On the other hand, if the situation is such that you have a spin up and a spin down around the hole, this hole can basically freely delocalize as much as it wants and the spin order is fully intact. So, and that basically, uh, in this, if, the, if this is the ground set, basically, that means uh, uh, the spins and the holes, well, they, they don't couple, they don't care for each other. Um, and that is what we tested uh, in our experiment. So, um, again, what is shown here is what I showed you already before, is basically uh, the uh, down, uh, up, down, down, up, uh, down, down, and so on, order between uh, the spins. And now we analyze our data and look specifically for events where we have a hole and now ask the question, what is the alignment of the spins around that hole? And what we find is indeed, compared to the case where you have full filling, all atoms there basically, where you have up, down, up, in this case we have up, hole, down. That means this two-point correlator, it really flips its sign compared to the case if you have a hole there or if you have not a hole there. And that is something we can again directly test. We can make this test uh, uh, also a bit more um, on longer length scale, we can uh, sit, for example, on a distance of four sides and ask now the question, what happens if we have no holes in between the four sides? Well, then you can look here, we expect basically co positive correlation, so this, this one. Now we add one hole between the four sides, this thing flips, we get negative correlation. We add another hole, we get positive correlations. If we add three holes, so basically two spins here and only holes in between, well, they are direct neighbors again and we see uh, uh, here, sorry, we see negative correlations here again. So that works, we can directly study a single hole, uh, what it does uh, uh, basically to spin correlators. So what I was describing you so far was basically only direct environment around the hole and um, very close distance physics. And uh, I can tell you I stay mostly short distance in this talk, but I want to give you an idea actually of how you can analyze uh, also um, uh, 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 longer range physics uh, in the system based on, um, based on string correlators. And for that I want first you to understand um, what actually these holes do. So let's assume we don't have a hole. So we have the perfect order, up, down, up, down, and so on and so forth. Now if you have a hole, you sh I showed you already that if you have a hole, basically the order here from down, down goes to from down and then up. But that means now all the spins in this block until the next hole basically have been flipped from here to here. So now if I have a fluctuating hole number and just calculate normal two-point correlators, let's say around uh, 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 in, uh, between these two sides, then this flip of what we call the antiferromagnetic parity of this uh, block, and not only we, <laughs> of this block, basically uh, leads to an averaging of upspins and downspins, and then basically to a vanishing of the correlator. So the question, so that is kind of a trivial uh, impact of the holes to the spin order, because you see basically the spin order here still looks pretty good. So we have up, we have down, we have up, we have down, we have up. It's just that the holes displace basically this ordering. So now how can we get that back? Well, one obvious way is we just kick out also all the holes and we shift everything together. We go to so-called squeeze space. So that is the idea of, uh, came out of Jan, Jan Zanen's group. So you see basically, we basically remove the holes in post-analysis and basically shift together, shift everything together, we get squeeze space and there you get perfect antiferromagnetic order. And this is now completely independent of how many holes we had in this chain. 
And uh, the, another way, which is largely equivalent, but it's very interesting because of this is my, my basically comment on topological order parameters, um, uh, that is basically um, instead of squeezing out the holes, we, um, we, we basically go through the chain, and for each and every hole, we, we basically multiply the, uh, the next sites by a minus one. Basically, we flip their spin in the analysis to, uh, to basically have the correlator right again that it respects this, uh, this uh, uh, spin flip around the hole. Um, and that is basically then amounts to measuring of a string order cor uh, correlator where you have this charge string, uh, string of the product of minus ones in there. Um, and again, this is exactly the thing you also would have to measure to detect um, uh, uh, order in Haldane chains where you have, instead of whole spin ups and downs, you have basically spin zero, spin ones, and spin minus ones. And I want to stress, this is really something that until the advent of these microscopes, uh, you could, there was no known way of how to measure it, because of if you want to measure that correlator between side one and eight, you have to know everything in between. So this is a project, this is a really a non-local uh, uh, order parameter. Okay, let's see how that works in the experiment. Um, so we have now a fluctuating whole number and measure the standard two-point correlator. Um, I, I said already that basically amounts of uh, averaging this ups and downs because if we don't know which whole number is there and you see basically we have next neighbor correlations which is basically a Pauli blocking uh, effect and then basically we see no correlations. Now analyze the same data in terms of the string order parameter and we said before you see we say basically get fully get back uh, the, uh, the antiferromagnetic correlation, um, yeah, which shows you basically that the only effect that the holes have is this trivial effect of displacing uh, uh, the order. Um, another example uh, in squeeze space, this time we basically bin our data into, dense, into sectors of fixed density. So the green data here is around unity filling. It's a density of 0.95 to 1.5. Uh, and you see basically we see this uh, uh, typical, uh, typical two-point correlations I've, you've seen already before. But if you go to the very low density sector where you have very many holes, the blue one here, we basically we do not see anything of these of this, uh, staggered correlations anymore. Now we analyze the same thing in squeeze space. We squeeze everything together, and you see basically com it's basically completely independent uh, what we get there uh, of the whole number. So all cases show very nice zigzagging uh, behavior. And again, that emphasizes the spins. They don't really care how many holes you have there. You just have to analyze the system uh, in the right way. And now if this is really true, um, we should be able to describe the system as an effective Heisenberg model. Uh, remember, the spins uh, are described by an Heisenberg model at unity filling. And what I showed you basically that if we analyze it correctly, we don't care for the filling, the spins always behave the same. So we should be able to write, describe that by an effective Heisenberg model. But now, of course, if we have finite temperature, the, the strength of this coupling here becomes important. Because you believe me, if I have one spin there at this side of the room, the other spin there, and holes only in between, they will hardly speak to each other. So they will have a very reduced coupling. And that means, basically, the uh, coupling strength in this effective model depends on the filling, how many atoms you have there. Actually, it depends also on the, uh, on the correlations uh, that, that are modified by the temperature, and that is why you see, basically, this curvy behavior uh, for different temperatures. But let's, let's say the main effect for now is really uh, that we see a strongly reduced coupling if we uh, sit have a very low filling, so which means one's been there, one's been there. Um, then we hardly have any coupling. So now, how can we test this? I should say, I mean, this is basically all this uh, theory uh, that is backing up this year now. This has been done in Eugene Demler's group uh, by Fabian Kost. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so, um, so how can we test this experimentally? Well, we can try if we can model, and now it's important, our finite temperature data um, on the spins using this effective squeeze space uh, Heisenberg model. So the idea here is, again, we bin our data versus density that you've seen already before. Um, and now we analyze here only the next neighbor correlator and the next next neighbor correlator. And now what happens if this effective coupling goes down, but we still have the same temperature? That means we increase effectively the entropy. You know, we have just some temperature and we, add, we, we shift now more and more quantum states basically in this, in this range that is set by the temperature. Um, so that happens from here to here. So what you expect if in the Heisenberg model entropy increases, then you expect obviously that correlations go down. 
So that is what we see in the experiment. We see strong correlations here. So this is on point three, the next neighbor. Then, uh, this one is on point one, the next next neighbor. And then they go down and they go to zero. And actually, they just they don't do that in a, in an arbitrary way. But they basically follow the predictions of this effective uh, model here for temperatures around point uh, eight uh, J. So um, this matches very nicely and confirms again that the spins and charges are independent. And uh, this uh, actually, at least in the, in the, in the very large uh, U-limit, um, so well, to introduce the slide, you know, I, I basically started the whole talk with uh, emphasizing some universality of physics in one dimension, but the point is, Lattinger liquid physics in general in 1D is only limit in the very long wavelength low energy limit. What we tested here was basically correlations at one side, two sides, something like this distance. So this is not really in the, in the realm of the uh, Lattinger liquid, but the point is the, the Heisenberg model, 1D Heisenberg model, at least in the infinite U limit, has been shown actually to uh, fully uh, uh, to fully separate, basically the wave function fully separates into a free fermion uh, wave function for the charges and an effective Heisenberg uh, wave function um, at all uh, energies, basically. So that is also why, that is basically explaining why we see spin charge separation. Point is now, we do not have infinite U. So can we see something that there is a remaining coupling between the spin and charges? And the answer is in the experiment, not fully, but uh, if we ask our theory colleagues, we actually can get this information. So what you see here is basically, again, what you've seen before, the staggered correlator and the correlations around the holes. So now, if this model, if the, if the effective Heisenberg model is completely, uh, or if the spins and the charges are completely separated, then you would say at t equals zero, these points here should be completely equivalent. So because of these spins, this here is a direct neighbor, like here, these two, and this one here is also a neighbor, basically a direct neighbor, it's just a hole in between. But if you are t equals zero, the energy scale doesn't matter. So now if we ask this question, what are the correlations here at t equals zero compared in this and this case, then if everything separates, it should be the same. That means this difference here, what we plot here is the length of this green arrow, go, should go to zero. But the theory says it doesn't do it actually. It stays finite and that is basically because of we have corrections due to uh, non-infinite u. Okay, with this, uh, I want to basically finish and highlight uh, the people that did this work in the lab, and that is, uh, first of all, the postdoc, uh, Guillaume Salomon, uh, and then uh, these three uh, PhD students here, Timon Hilger, Ahmed Omran, and Martin Boll. Uh, and then, uh, I think I can skip the summary, and I want to first give you a teaser of what we can do, actually, with this data analysis. So, so when you, you see here, we can do post-selection tricks and basically uh, measure full order. Uh, of these chains and we think we can access low temperature physics by that. And well, what we want to do in the future is clearly we want to extend this all and bring these nice uh, techniques to 2D. Um, yeah, thank you.